Right. Good evening and welcome to Getting to Know Your Neighbor's Faith, Ask Me Anything. Um, this month we have Rabbi Alana Rosen Brown, and who will talk to us about Reform Judaism. Um, sorry for the technical difficulties. There's always something, isn't there? So um, I will jump right in because Rabbi Alana needs to actually leave a little early tonight. So all the announcements I will make at the end. So please bear, bear with me at the end of the evening. Um, first, I will just say, I will before my introduction for, for her, I will say that if you have any questions and you're on, visiting on Zoom, to type them into the chat box and Scott will read them off. And those of you who are in here in person can raise your hand. All right, so here we go. Um, rabbi Alana is a rabbi cantor at Congregation Rodef Shalom in San Rafael, California, where she has served since 2014. A native East Coaster, Alana grew up in Hartford, Connecticut, holds a BA in history and education from Middlebury College, Vermont, and has studied and lived in places ranging from South Korea to New York City, South Africa to Jerusalem. In addition to her ordinations and degrees in sacred music and Hebrew literature from HUCJIR, Alana is currently pursuing a master's in integrative health studies at the California Institute of Integral Studies. At Congregation Rodef Shalom, she leads, she leads adult learning and social justice initiatives in addition to being involved with family engagement where she strives to co-create a community that is fully inclusive of interfaith Jewish multi-faith families. Alana serves on the boards of the Marin Interfaith Council, the Interfaith Sustainable Food Collaborative, and RAC, California's leadership team, and is currently the Bay Area Rabbinic Fellow for 18 Doors. In her spare time, which it sounds like she doesn't have that much, she enjoys backpacking, enjoying exploring libraries, and checking out the local music scene. So I will hand it off to you. Oh, thank you so much. Hi, everyone. Thank you for being here, those of you who came in person and those of you who are here virtually. So um, Judaism, I've taught an exploring Judaism class for eight of the nine years that I've been at Congregation Road of Shalom, and it's one of my absolutely favorite things to do partially because I love answering questions and I love asking questions. And every time I teach it, basic Judaism course, of course, I deepen my understanding of Judaism through the questions that are asked. And um, in thinking about what to teach tonight about Judaism, and we'll have lots of time for questions, um, but in such a short amount of time, I did what I never do, which was, I think I'm gonna go as basic as possible. But of course, basic is never basic because it's also as complex as we wanna make it. Uh, but where I decided I really wanted us to start is with the Jewish calendar year. Because um, while you know so many of the values of the Jewish tradition are shared by our other faith traditions in wonderful ways, um, I thought, you know, if I start with text, there's so much that I'm talking about that's shared. But one of the things that really is different and unique are each of our holidays and the ways that we celebrate and observe and ritualize the Jewish calendar year. So that's where I thought we would start. And many of you, I'm sure, already have a lot of familiarity with this. I have no idea who's in our room. Um, but I have a couple of handouts and Reverend Scott is going to be sharing this. Here's more um, sharing what I'm passing out on the screen, which is just a PowerPoint that I created about the Jewish seasonal cycle. And I'd love to talk through the Jewish calendar year and the rituals of the holidays. A lot of the time, times my students in my Exploring Judaism class, and I do start way complex with them because I really want to dive into the texts. But after we've done so many texts, they'll say to me, well, my head is spinning because there's just text after text after text. And how do I know that 
I'm really doing Judaism. And I really do say, you know, if you start by just observing the holiday cycle and um, Shabbat when you can, the day of rest when you can, you're really, you're really doing Judaism. So that's where we're going to start. I like to start the calendar year at midsummer with Tisha B'Av. Now, many of you probably have heard Rosh Hashanah is the head of the year, right? That's the Jewish New Year um, in the fall. But the reason that I think of the beginning of the Jewish calendar year at this holiday of Tisha B'Av is because there is um, a deep spiritual turn that happens in preparation for the high holidays that begins with Tisha B'Av and that can be counted from Tisha B'Av. And so the high holiday cycle, when you hear the high holidays, we often think of the two holidays, Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, and the, the 10 days of awe that are inclusive of Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, and the days in between. Um, but I really think of the whole high holiday cycle as beginning with Tisha B'Av and ending with Simchat Torah, which is a couple of months, because um, it's, it takes us through a certain cadence of self-reflection and the full gamut of emotions that help us to really experience that season. So if you turn to the next page, Tisha B'Av, which the English is the ninth of Av, right? So it just, it's a day of the month of Av. And this is a day of collective mourning. It's the day that the Jewish community um, prior to the Holocaust right now, actually tonight is the end of Yom HaShoah, uh, the day that we commemorate the Holocaust um, that happened in World War II. Prior to that, there were many days of Jewish mourning and the ninth of Av has existed as that collective day of mourning to think about the destruction of the first temple in Jerusalem in 586 BCE, and then the second temple in 70 CE, and then mythologically speaking, many events of mourning are considered to have happened on the 9th of Av. Do we, you know, every event, the expulsion of the Jews from Spain happened on the 9th of Av. And so the Jewish calendar um, uses this day to deeply mourn um, and think about our collective mourning experience. And we read from Echa, the Book of Lamentations. Um, it's a full day uh, spent in prayer and study and lament. And of course, um, one of the main ideas is about sinat chinam, baseless hatred between people um, that can lead to destruction. And the sinat chinam here, the baseless hatred, it was considered, um, we're thinking about Jews and other members of Jewish community. How are we treating one another even internally in our community? So it's a time to reflect on how we can turn baseless hatred into boundless love. Then we have following Tisha B'Av, we have the seven weeks of consolation that we count. So the next page is actually just images of Jerusalem on Tisha B'Av, people in mourning, sitting by candlelight. Um, we have the seven weeks of consolation where we're moving from the darkest day of the year to Rosh Hashanah, and we read from the Book of Prophets words of consolation. Then four weeks before Rosh Hashanah, we have the month of Elul, which is considered the beginning of the deep spiritual looking into our souls um, to do Teshuvah, the process of apology and forgiveness um, and transformation, um, making amends between ourselves and ourselves, ourselves and one another. We're tasked in going to our relationships in our lives that um, maybe are in conflict and trying to find ways to uh, come back together and between ourselves and God. And so we spend the month in deep prayer and self-reflection in preparation for Rosh Hashanah. And there are special prayers during that time, many of which 
a lot of people in the Jewish community who don't end up observing Elul, many of these prayers do show up on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, some of the same liturgy, um, but those of us who have a, a um, deep observance of Elul can experience those, those penitential prayers during that month. So Rosh Hashanah, many of us are familiar with that, the symbol of apples and honey and sweetness. Um, it is one of the four new years that was in the Talmud. Um, others are, include Pesach and uh, Tu Bishvat, but really most of the Jewish community nowadays thinks of this as the beginning of our calendar year. And I love that as a scholar who always is in school because it's also the beginning of the school year. So I will never not think of it as the beginning of the year. Um, Erev Rosh Hashanah is, um, sorry, Rosh Hashanah is really a synagogue based holiday, right? So, so many of our holidays we can observe in our homes. And there's lots of home rituals. And there's only a few holidays that really so much of the observance, um, the prayers are not prayers that most Jews know on their own. It's something that is really kind of a, a clergy informal day. And so it's the time of year where um, the most Jews show up to synagogue to hear some of their most beloved prayers. And the key prayers on Rosh Hashanah are Hineni on the evening of Rosh Hashanah, um, which is about the cantor um, you know, saying, I am but humble before all of you, and will you join me in being humble together in the work, the spiritual work we're going to be doing together for the next 10 days, and the Unatana Tokef prayer, which reminds us of the fragility of life, and that at any moment, um, we were all mortal at any moment, we, we could pass on, and so we really go deeply into fragility. And there's a beautiful tashlich symbol of casting away um, those things that are no longer, those things that are holding us back. So there are some images on the next page of a shofar being blown to wake up to the new year and people casting off uh, their, you know, things that they want to change in the new year. So Yom Kippur is the end of these 10 days of self-reflection. By Yom Kippur, you know, we're really urged, there's the symbol of the gates of prayer closing and the book of life being open before us uh, during, during, from Rosh Hashanah to Yom Kippur and the book of life that's going to be sealed um, after Yom Kippur. And so it's really the time. I love that symbolism. Of course, I believe that the gates of prayer are always open to us, but I do love the symbolism of the urgency, right? That, um, and so I do use it as a symbol, you know, during this time, I really must talk to the people that um, I haven't spoken with about um, issues that need to be resolved. And I must do that before Yom Kippur. And so I use that symbolism um, to urge me on. So Yom Kippur is a fast day. Um, it's also a synagogue-based holiday. Beautiful prayers, the most famous of which is Kol Nidre, which is the most famous melody in the Jewish tradition sung in the evening. And um, you'll see, you know, you'll see what we refrain from wearing leather, makeup, decorative clothing, bathing, and sexual relations. And it's a full day of prayer. And then um, we have this very quick turnaround between Yom Kippur and Sukkot, which is also called Zman Simchatenu, the season of our joy. And a few days after Yom Kippur, um, as soon as Yom Kippur ends, people start uh, constructing their Sukkot, with, which means booths. Mm -hmm. So an informal dwelling place, maybe in their backyard. Um, some people do it on their balconies. You'll see that in Jerusalem if there's no backyard. Um, and it's supposed to have thatched uh, roof and it's open to the stars and um, you know, open on at least one side and there's, you know, halachic Jewish law instructions about it, but the symbolism is a t about feeling impermanence, 
um, and also the joy of the harvest. And so there are only two mitzvot. Mitzvot are commandments um, for Sukkot, Sukkot, one of which is to dwell in the sukkah, right? To, to sit there. You don't have to live there all eight days, but some people like to sleep in their Sukkot, um, which I think is a beautiful tradition. And the other is to shake the lulav and the etrog, which you can see on the next page. So there's an image of a sukkah and um, the etrog is the citrus fruit. And then there are three species that form the lulav that you shake um, to remind us that we're all interconnected and that divine is everywhere. And after these eight days, so we've gone from like a day of deep contemplation and Sukkot is known as like the happiest holiday. We're supposed to be in jubilation. And Simchat Torah is really just a holiday um, celebrating the Torah. Um, it's at the end of Sukkot. And um, it's when we end a cycle of reading Torah, the five books of Moses. So we're, we read the last uh, Torah portion in Deuteronomy and then we begin again. And so we dance with the Torahs. You'll see on the next page, people, pictures of holding Torahs. And it's very customary to unroll the entire scroll of the Torah so that people, many people, especially in the progressive Jewish world, have never seen the inside of a Torah scroll. And so it's a chance for everyone who shows up to see the inside of the Torah scroll and to learn a little bit more. Annika, you've probably heard, or you may have heard, um, sometimes we, we Jews say, oh, it's really just a minor holiday, but it's become a big deal in America because it's proximal to Christmas and it's become a commercial holiday. And it's, it makes Jewish kids feel good that they have something to when they don't have Christmas. Um, I would disagree with that. I never say that it's a minor holiday because it's so beloved in America. And I think that's important. If everyone wants to celebrate Hanukkah and it's one of the most celebrated of the Jewish holidays, Passover is actually the most celebrated Jewish holiday in the world for those who don't celebrate every Jewish holiday. A lot of secular Jews, of course. Um, and then Hanukkah and Yom Kippur are the next ones. So people love Hanukkah, make it a huge deal. Why we say that it's only a minor holiday is because it's not a holiday that was commanded to us in the Torah, right? It's from the book of Maccabees and was later talked about in the Talmud. So because it's not a Torah holiday and kind of emerged later, it's not one of the big ones, um, but I say, it's important, really celebrate it. The only thing you have to do <laughs> on Hanukkah is eat fried foods <laughs> and light your, it's actually a Hanukkiah because it has nine. We always call it a menorah. Technically a menorah only has seven. But if you say, I'm gonna light my Hanukkiah, most people think that you sound crazy because they always call it a menorah. So I call it a menorah too, <laughs> because that's what, what most people call it. And um, some of the themes on Hanukkah, Hanukkah of course means dedication. So it was the rededication of a temple that was desecrated by the Greeks. Um, so there's a lot of themes about what does it mean to be a minoritized people who has a choice either to assimilate or to find ways to retain their customs. And um, we're lucky enough in America to be able to retain customs in a relatively safe situation that hasn't always been the case. So it's really, I think of it as a celebratory holiday of the freedom to observe religion in safety and to have that religion honored. Then we have Tu Bishvat is our next holiday, which usually happens around the end of January, beginning of February. I think this, like, this should be the biggest Jewish holiday in because it's our ecological holiday. It's the new year of the trees. This is also a holiday from the Talmud. It was one of those four new years that was prescribed. 
And um, for years, we didn't know, we, my ancestors 2000 years ago, didn't know, you know, what did this mean? Okay, there's this to be shvat. So it developed over centuries. How do we ritualize Jewish Earth Day or the New Year of the Trees? And um, in the Middle Ages, the Kabbalists, the Jewish mystics, um, decided to do a Seder. Seder means order, but it's really from kind of the, um, you know, a Greek symposium style um, dinner where, um, um, so Seder, like the Passover Seder, they kind of took it from that and said, let's do a Seder also for Tu Bishvat, where we eat four different kinds of fruits. Oh, I'm sorry, three different kinds of fruits. And we drink four cups of wine. And we're going to include cosmology from the four worlds of the Jewish mystics. So it's this mystical uh, Seder experience to celebrate the fruits of trees. And it's really quite a beautiful, beautiful tradition. And you'll see on the next page, trees. You'll see a picture of a Seder table set up for Tu Bishvat. Um, it's a custom to plant trees or plant in your garden. Our next holiday is Purim. For shorthand, I, I call it the Jewish Halloween. More people more on the Orthodox spectrum wouldn't like if I said that, but I don't care about that. And so um, think of it as the Jewish Halloween. It's when we dress up and we read um, the book of Esther, um, which is a very interesting book. Also, you know, as you know, know it's from the writings of the Tanakh. Um, and it doesn't mention the name of God in it. It's really interesting that it ended up being included in the canon. And it's actually a comedy. I mean, it's a tragedy and a comedy. It typifies the Jewish experience of turning tragedy into comedy, of making jokes out of genocide, really. Um, so this, this story is about a genocide that almost happened, but was overturned. And then the Jewish people get to celebrate. So, um, but it really, when they talk about it from a literary perspective, um, because of where it was written in Persia, um, and it, it, the author um, was familiar with um, Greek literature. And so there are elements that you can see of a Greek comedy. Um, so there's purposeful hyperbole. And there are four mitzvot of Purim. You have to hear the Megillah being read, right? You've heard the, you know, there's a phrase, the whole Megillah, right? I actually just heard someone say that on like a sitcom and it wasn't a Jewish character. So I know it's out there to describe, um, it's everything, inclusive of everything, right? The whole Megillah. So you have to hear the whole Megillah being read. You have to drink before you, until you don't know the difference between evil and good, between Haman and Mordechai. You have to give tzedakah, so give charity, gifts of charity, and send people um, packages called Mishloach Manot of um, cookies that are hamantashen, the three-sided cookies, or just lovely packages of food. And so you'll see all of this on the next page. And there are carnivals for the kids and everyone's dressed in costume. And there's often a Purim spiel, which is a play that, um, you know, a play that dramatizes the story of Esther. And of course, even though it's, you know, very festive, and I do think it's indicative of how the Jewish tradition has tried to laugh at our suffering over the years, um, there's, of course, very deeply important themes to talk about. Um, you know, Esther, in the end, finds courage to stand up for her people and to say to the king, I am Jewish. You didn't know I was Jewish, but I'm going to tell you that I am Jewish and reveal that at the risk of her life. And so I think there are you know, deep messages about being Jewish in the world and how to be proud of being Jewish in a world that isn't always kind to Jews. 
So um, the next page is Passover, the holiday that we just observed. Um, some religious scholars, I can't quote them directly, but we'll say, you know, we'll compare religions and say, what is the central theme of each religion? And often with Judaism, they say freedom and liberation is the central theme of, of, of what it means to be Jewish and practice Judaism. Um, and that's because of the story of the Exodus and all the many commandments that, that we are commanded to remember the moment of the exodus, we were slaves in Egypt, we're now going to be freed. Um, and that occurs daily in our prayers that we're always commanded to remember the exodus. Um, it occurs, you know, in many of our rituals. And of course, it occurs on Passover when we tell the story of the exodus from Egypt, and we are commanded to um, tell the story and to have a wonderful Seder and to eat matzah, the bread of affliction, for eight days, um, and to refrain from eating anything that rises, and um, to read from the Haggadah. And there's so many, I'm sure many of you have been to seders before. There are so many other rituals associated with Passover. But on the next page is some pictures of a family at a seder. Um, and this is one of the, the holidays you've probably seen as we've gone through the Jewish calendar, um, which holidays, which of the many holidays can really just be celebrated at home without an institution. And this is the, this holiday, Hanukkah, you don't need to go to the synagogue, you're, you're celebrating with your family at home. From Hanukkah, not from Hanukkah, from Passover, we're in this period now, to Shavuot, we have the period of counting the Omer, which is on the second evening of Passover, we count 49 days, because in the Torah, it tells us that from the time of the Exodus in Egypt, there were 49 days before we, uh, we received the Torah on Mount Sinai. So the only custom, but I think it's a beautiful custom to count each day, is to say a blessing each night. And the blessing is, you know, I bless you, Adonai, who commanded me to count the Omer. And Omer is a sheaf of wheat, a method of counting. Um, and then you count, you literally count the day that you're on in Hebrew. And you're counting up to Shavuot, which is the holiday of commemorating receiving the Torah on Mount Sinai. I skipped over Lagba Omer, which I won't talk about. It's just a very fun day to have bonfires and it means something within the counting of the Omer. It's the 33rd day of counting. So Shavuot, we celebrate the receiving of the Torah and um, we celebrate it by chanting from the book of Ruth. And it's we have a Tikkun Leil Shavuot. The main thing, this is my favorite holiday because the main thing to do is to study all night long and to eat dairy. And I love cheese. So I just think it's such a fabulous holiday. Study all night long and eat dairy. And in, um, in Jerusalem, it's wonderful because people there, all of the houses, so many houses are open. You can wander the streets and just wander into a house and somebody is there teaching text and um, you can study there and then you can go to another house to study and you can wander the streets studying all night and then at about five in the morning everyone starts walking towards the old city to be able to pray shachari in the morning um, shachari is the morning services so those are the primary um, religious holidays of the jewish calendar cycle I didn't mention um, the civil holidays, which one of which was Yom HaShoah, which we just observed, the commemoration of the Holocaust. And then um, the holidays coming up next week, which are um, Yom HaZikaron and Yom HaAtzmaut. Uh, they're you know, primarily holidays in Israel to observe fallen soldiers. Um, kind of like Memorial Day and um, Israeli independence. Yom Ha'atzmau is also called El Nakba, the, um, the Nakba, the catastrophe for the Palestinians. 
So I wanted to pause there for, I don't know what time it is, yeah, for questions about the holidays. Do we have any questions online? Let's go ahead and jump right into those. Um, well, first a comment. Uh, thank you, Rabbi Alana. This is so rich. Uh, you make me feel that I would love to be a Jew. <laughs> um, and then a couple of questions. Um, is a secular Jew like a secular Christian? I can't, I mean, we'd have to have a discussion about that because I actually, I don't know how a secular Christian would define themselves. Um, but I can just talk about it from the Jewish perspective that Judaism is often talked about, well, it's a religion, but it's also a people, the Jewish people, it's a peoplehood. Um, it's an ethnicity, um, it's a culture, and at times in history, it has been a race because that's how the Jewish people have been defined by others at times in history. And so um, you don't have to, if you're Jewish, you don't have to identify with all of those um, characteristics of being Jewish. You can say, I'm Jewish and identify with the culture or the ethnicity and not at all with the religious aspects of being Jewish. This is something that often confuses members of other faiths. But when we say secular Judaism, um, it usually means someone that's not, obser not observant religiously or even at all, right? So there are Jews who might identify as they are Jewish as a religion, but maybe they celebrate three of the holidays. And that's what they do Jewishly during the year, but, they, but they're Jewish. Um, and that a same person might call themselves secular if they only celebrate three of the holidays because they might be celebrating that um, in a cultural way. So yeah, I don't know if that helps or confuses, um, but a secular Jew is someone that deeply identifies as Jewish but may not be observant of the rituals. May I keep going? Um, how do Jews keep those who have died in their prayers and memory? Um, sure. So um, you may know about the mourning rituals of Judaism. So um, after, some, after a person dies, um, we have rituals of Taharan Shmirav, guarding, guarding the body. We're really guarding the soul before the person is buried. We're, we're protecting the soul that is reluctant to leave the body. And we say prayers and psalms, and the body is cleaned and buried. Um, after the body is buried, we observe a, a week of um, Shiva where um, that's the most intense period of mourning. And um, a person usually is in their home and they receive guests. The mirrors are covered and the door is open um, because as supporters of the mourners, we're not supposed to ask anything of the mourner because their sole task is to be in mourning for seven days. Um, after the seven days, that person will get up and walk around the block symbolically saying they're ready to re-enter the world, but then there's a period of shloshim, which is 30 days of mourning. There are certain rituals, um, like saying the Kaddish prayer is a mourner's prayer, which we say for a full year every day. Um, but also during these days of Shloshim, we might study a text in our loved one's honor. And um, we still observe, you know, we don't do celebrate during that period of the 30 days. Then after the 30 days, we can go back to certain celebrations, but we're still saying Kaddish every day for our loved one. And so the period of traditional mourning is considered to be over after the first year, but then four times a year, we have prayers called Yiskor, 
where everyone who's ever lost someone can come and it's a collect it's a service of mourning so that's four times a year um, and then on the anniversary of your loved one's death you um, you find a minion a group of 10 people or come to a synagogue to say the Kaddish prayer to remember your loved one and the Kaddish prayer is considered um, also to be a way of accompanying your loved one's soul to its next iteration I'll jump in with a question. So um, do, do Jewish people not, do you not do cremation? Traditionally, we don't do cremation. Now today, a lot of reform Jews, especially um, might ask for that for various reasons. It's less expensive than a burial. Um, they might you know, think it's more environmentally friendly, um, but traditionally Jews are not supposed to be cremated. And we as the reform movement, you know, it's really our job to, um, you know, to be as inclusive as possible. So if someone wants to be cremated, that's their wish. And we think the, you know, the highest form of the mitzvah it said that the holiest mitzvah is the mitzvah of burying the dead because it's the one, deed that we cannot receive anything in return um, and so to honor our loved one's wishes is the holiest thing we can do and so for us if the loved one's wishes are to be cremated then of course we would you know say yes of course traditionally jews and orthodox jews um, would say if someone's cremated then we won't say Kaddish for them, or, you know, it, it's very strict. We won't observe other laws of Judaism with mourning. Yeah. Thank you. Are there more questions? Yeah. yeah, keep going, keep going. I mean. <laughs> uh, there are comments and questions and a request. So um, I'll start with the, just go in sequence. Uh, the comment, um, basically, would it be fair to say that Judaism is more like a way of life in contrast to what one believes. Where in some religions, it's more about what you believe and leaving certain things uh, about faith, where Judaism is more of a way of life. Well, I'll answer in a very Jewish way. Could be, maybe. <laughs> and answer a question with a question. It's something you might hear a lot right that judaism is a religion of action and other i don't like those i just feel like that simplifies things for some jews belief is very is deeply important as well um, but yes i would definitely say judaism is a way of life um, and then how an individual Jew interprets what that way of life is, whether they're led by faith and belief or whether they're led by um, action, mitzvot, the commandments. I think when people say that, it's because um, as Jews, we are welcome to question, like questioning is the center of what it means to be Jewish. Question everything and you can argue with God, you can question God, you can be an atheist, it doesn't matter, you can still be Jewish. And so you can live a very Jewish life without believing in God because you are following Jewish law or you're, follow, or you're observing all of the holidays and you might not be guided by a belief in God. But many Jews are guided by a deep belief in God or a deep faith. Well, actually, that leads into one of a later question that I'll just go ahead and ask now. That's all right. Uh, one of the questions was How would you describe in your own words what God is to you and what difference that makes in, a day, in your daily life? Well, how I described God changes all of the time. Um, I would say that I have a deep relationship with God and that relationship is um, experiential. I can't uh, really put words to it, though for me as a person who have, 
who has always loved prayer, I've always imagined that there is a receiver of that prayer, a witness of that prayer. Um, that witness, there's no image to go with that witness, right? In Judaism, we don't have an image for God, except for the one that the same ones that we all have that the artists created for us over the centuries. Um, but there's not meant to be an image. And so there's never been an image for me of what that 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 divine relationship that I have is, but I know that there's a receiver on the other end of of my prayer and I have a deep prayer life. And um, I don't believe that God is necessarily going to answer my prayers. I don't believe that, you know, God um, necessarily intercedes, but also I am a human being who has been very lucky in my life and at the same time that I don't um, intellectually believe that God intercedes, I have felt that God is there and present in all of the um, blessings that I have in my life. So I have a deep relationship with God, but I can't really put words to it other than I'm always in relationship with something larger than myself. Sure. Um, one last one. Um, how can you help us understand the distinctiveness of Reform Judaism compared to conservative Judaism or Reconstructionist or some other forms of mm -hmm. Judaism? So Reform Judaism, which I didn't grow up, you can you know, I grew up conservative, reconstructionist, and renewal, but not reform Judaism. So, of course, you can, within Judaism, um, move through the different denominations. Um, reform Judaism, I think, has a beautiful history um, that really begins a little bit before um, Napoleon made Jews citizens, right? But it it really begins with the in, Enlightenment. And when the Enlightenment occurred in Europe, Jews suddenly had a choice that they never had before, which was they could leave the ghettos. And when they lived in the ghettos in their own communities, um, there was, you know, you you couldn't go to a secular university. You weren't allowed to, so you didn't have any choice about assimilating. And once you were free to be able to participate in life with non-Jews, then you started asking yourself questions. How, how, do I just wanna be Jewish in my home? Do I wanna blend in in other places? Um, do you know all sorts of questions about how to live a Jewish life and so the birth of the reform movement comes from those questions. Um, many of the early reformers, of course, they all grew up what we know as orthodox the orthodox, by the way, that we know today is not the Judaism of the second century it's also a response to the enlightenment and so whenever you hear you think oh orthodox is the real Judaism it's not it's just another response to the enlightenment. Um, it's not realer in my estimation than Reformed Judaism. So many, often many people think of, oh, there's a hierarchy of Judaism, but there's not. There are different responses to modernity. And so the early reformers said, we believe that Judaism is a historically evolving tradition. It always has been actually. The Judaism of the Torah was not the Judaism that changed and evolved after the second temple was destroyed. Um, and so the reformers said, you know, we've changed over time and we need to continue to adapt and change to the ways that Jews live their lives today. So they did crazy things like um, translate the prayer book into the vernacular language so that more people could follow along. And they introduced the organ, they introduced instruments because um, they thought that would make it more joyful for people. And of course, that was scandalous at the time. And again, 
you know, you had these different factions that were forming. So that's, I mean, I see Lynn looking at her watch and I do have to go to another event. So that's kind of the origins. And what does that look like today with Reform Judaism? Um, one of the reasons I am now a Reform Jew and I did not stay a conservative Jew is because I think Reform Judaism has been on the forefront of making changes um, that um, can, are the most inclusive of people who want to be Jewish, for instance. Um, in the 1970s, we said, you know, if somebody was born to a Jewish father, but not a Jewish mother, and that person was brought up Jewish, if they say they're Jewish, they're Jewish. The conservative movement still says you're only Jewish if um, you are Jewish through your mother's line. No matter if you were raised Jewish and your father's Jewish, you're not. But there was patrilineal descent at one time in Jewish history. So um, if I talk too long about this, my real opinions will show. Um, so maybe that's bad. But, um, you know, we also say, you know, interfaith marriage is a, is a good thing. It's a way for there to be more Jewish allies in the world. Um, and other, so these are some of the ways that we are, we are different and have evolved to meet the needs of today's Jewish community in ways that other denominations um, will, like the conservative movement will in 20 years, probably. <laughs> Should I name the report, you have a question? Oh, I don't have any questions. I was going to say, I want to be respectful. She needed to leave early and you're already past where you thought you needed to leave. And it sounds like there's a ton of more questions there was, or- There was a request. Okay. I'll What's hear that? the request and I'm so sorry. We have an event at Kol Shofar tonight that was scheduled at the same time. So um, I'm so sorry that I have to leave. What is the request? It just said, um, knowing that you're also a cantor, is it allowed for you to sing a text for us? Oh, is it? yeah. Well, you can sing at any time in Judaism. I have to check. Okay. Um, hmm. That's a... Yeah, I do want to mention, first of all, I want to thank everyone for being here. And um, of course, this was only a, ta a taste. I had all of these other, maybe Scott, you're welcome to share, send out to people a list of Jewish values, which um, with their corresponding Torah text and many of the values, again, their values of Reform Judaism, but you'll see they're common to your traditions as well. Um, and so I'm sorry we didn't get to that, but I know we could only do a little. And I'm always available. You can always um, send me emails or ask me more questions at ilana at rotoshalom.org. And feel free to contact me with questions. And the more, again, the basis of Judaism is keep asking questions, keep challenging, um, and stay in dialogue with one another. So I hope that we'll stay in dialogue together. Um, and we'll end with Olam Chesed Ibane Yerarai Lai 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 Olam Chesed Ibane Yerarai Lai 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 Olam Chesed Ibane And that means we, the world will be built from love, from loving kindness. So may it be so, Kani Hiratzon. May it be so. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. And I'm Alana so sorry I have to needs leave. to run, but I want hope you stay on because I have a few announcements that I want to make, um, which I have to grab. Um, so let's see. Uh, this program, as many of you know, is an a Wednesday, third Wednesday of every month. Next month, we have um, Gloria and Bob Reese from the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. So um, 
come join us the third Wednesday of next month. That's in May. And then we have our first Wednesday, Release into Peace with Annie. The second Wednesday, our May meditation is with Ashley Reed, who many of you know, um, she used to work for MIC. So um, come join us for that. Um, big, big before that even is our um, prayer breakfast. So that is Wednesday, May 3rd, from eight to 10 in the morning at Congregation Cole Shafar in Tiburon. And you can uh, register for that through our website, um, which is marinifc.org. And you can also make a donation tonight if you'd like to. So um, that's all my announcements. But thank you for joining us and uh, look forward to, again, a wonderful uh, speakers. Speakers, we have two of them next, next month. You won't get to watch me up here. I'll have to sit over there. All right. Well, thank you for joining us and thank you for joining us in person. <laughs> Blessings. Thank you so much.